All right. Bomb DM, me amigos. All right. I'm going to go over this video here, problems with amillennialism here, but real quickly I want to address this comment here, unsubscribed, your wandering ways, wandering ways, trifle with our precious time, and I'm, I'm not sure what he means by that, I really don't, and I, I don't think I should apologize, really, the wind blows where it lists, and thou hearest the sound thereof. But canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it go. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Alright, so let's get into this video here. And let me just say, I don't want you to put a label on yourself. You're just going to trap yourself. Premillennial, postmillennial. Uh, a, a millennial, a preterist, don't put a label on yourself. If you're going to put any label on yourself, label yourself a Christian. Is that not good enough? All right, here we go. Hey everybody, Sean here, and I hope you're doing well. Today we'll take a closer look at amillennialism, so let's jump right in. There are three millennial views, premillennial, postmillennial, and amillennial. And there's also the preterist view. There's partial preterists and full preterists that believe that all Bible prophecy has been fulfilled. That includes the second coming of Christ, Satan and the Antichrist being thrown into the lake of fire, the resurrection of the dead, and the full arrival of the kingdom of God. This view would definitely need a separate video. But as stated in the video about the New Apostolic Reformation and the post-millennial error, this is not a topic to divide over. As scripture says, um, I... You know, I, I can't agree with that because if you're teaching a bonus thousand years after the end of the world, you're teaching a different religion. We're, we that are born of God, we put our hope in eternal life I mean if you're teaching something else that then there is a divide you're the one creating a division away from the truth iron sharpens iron and regardless of your view if you are saved through Christ then we are brothers and sisters in Christ and can grow together in this area all right, so first of all, let's go to Proverbs 27. Uh, I want you to pay attention to this. This is important, I think. Iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. So right here, this tells me this person does not believe the Bible they hold in their hands. And how do I know that? Because they're quoting from a corrupt Bible version. And if, when pushed, they always point to the Greek and Hebrew, meaning that they don't trust the Bible that they hold in their hands. With that being said, amillennialists believe like the postmillennialists believe that the 1,000 years spoken of in Revelation 20 does not mean a literal 1,000 years, but means a long period of time. But as mentioned in the last video, God used the words 1,000 years six times in Revelation 20. So if he meant it to mean a long period of time, he could have easily said it like that. Unlike post-millennials, amillennials believe that we are currently in the millennium. And this brings up some obvious questions. The first is the fact that in Revelation 20, 1-3, Satan is bound for 1,000 years in verse 2, and sealed in the abyss in the very next verse. And he... Right, notice here again, the phrasing here, abyss, this is not in Revelation 20. All right, so again, he's quoting from a corrupt Bible version. All right, I just I want to prove that to you. And cast him into the bottomless pit, okay? He would not deceive the nations any longer. 
The amillennialists will say that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross did this, that is, bound Satan. But Revelation says when he was bound... All right, notice he didn't quote the verse... Let's see if I can find the verse here. Um, let me find it here. Give me a second. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he will first bind the strong man. And then he will spoil his house. All right. So Jesus has come, and he has bound, or binded, the strong man. So that's the argument, okay? He, maybe he didn't know where, where to find it, but I just showed it to you, okay? He could no longer deceive the nations, so why are so many still being deceived? Not to make... Uh, okay, so, I mean, that's real simple, right? The last couple of videos, uh, I showed you um, that there is no contradiction in the Bible. There's no contradiction here either. He should deceive the nations no more. Now, to properly understand this, you've got to know in the Old Testament, there was the nation of uh, Israel, right? And the kingdom of God was with the children of God. And outside of that nation were the nations deceived by Satan. See, right here in Exodus 19, He shall be unto me an holy nation. Talking about the children of Israel. Now here comes Jesus, and he makes the kingdom of God available to whosoever believes in him. So now there are no nations and therefore they, the, Satan is bound and prevented from deceiving the nations. Right? Now we that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are an holy nation. I don't know how you missed that. Okay? So, this fella here in the video, he does not understand the difference between an individual and the nations. Right? It's not the same thing. His argument before was, well, if this was... A long period of time the thousand years if that was why didn't God just say it's a long period of time why does he say a thousand years well again apply that same logic why why doesn't God just say people if it would meant people instead it says that he should deceive the nations no more so there's not a you're not being fair to yourself you're not being honest to yourself when you take this and change it to individuals it's important to know the difference to mention other verses that show satan is still active on the earth and this binding has not happened yet it's still to so he's going to go on for couple minutes here making a, an argument based on a false assumption um in the future first peter 5 be alert and of sober mind your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking all right, all right so i gotta do this okay where's this at first peter 5 first peter 5 that this these are small points okay Be sober. All right. Be alert and of a sober mind. It's not the same. Right? It's a minor deal, but it's 
technically it's not the same. Be uh, and be alert and of sober mind. I mean, you can have a buzz and be alert and of sober mind. Right? For someone, I, you know, I, be sober, be vigilant. Right? It, these words are stronger, in my opinion, much, much stronger. And to devour. Second Corinthians four. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Uh, there we go. All right. So, Second Corinthians four. Again, this is uh, important stuff. This is important. That other one, it's kind of a minor deal right here. In whom the God of this world. That's that should be a capital G. Not a big deal, but it should be a capital G because there is Satan is not a god, and this is not talking about Satan. It's talking about God Almighty. And just in case somebody wants to some just in case somebody's ignorant about this, right? What was that? Second Corinthians two verse four. Is that right? No, four. I'm sorry. I don't know where it's at. I was just there ten seconds ago and I forgot it. Right there. In whom the God, capital G. All right. This is the sixteen eleven. All right. In whom the God, I don't know if you can see that right there, that's a capital G. That should be a capital G, okay? Because if it's not talking about God, if it's talking about Satan, then that verse or that Bible is um, contradictory to what we read in Exodus 20. And the very first commandment, man. The very first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. There's only one God. All right. There's only one God. And it's, it's pretty remarkable, really. There's only one God. Seeing it is one God. But to us there is but one God. One God. And Father of all, who is above all. For there is one God. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. If the devils thought Satan was God, then they would not believe there is one God. But there is just one God. And the devils even know that. But this fellow here... Maybe even you don't know that? Come on, man. Do you trust what the Bible says or don't you? James 4 tells us to resist the devil. Why resist if he's bound already and can't deceive? Romans 16 says the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. 2 Timothy 2, then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap. For they have been held captive by him to do whatever he... Okay, that's... I gotta go to that one here. Second Timothy... Second Timothy 2. That's kind of interesting. Come to your senses, man. 26. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare... Of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will that's kind of a goofy way to say stuff right there come to your senses man it's not I think this fella here needs to come to his senses because that's not what it says recover themselves out of the snare of the devil he wants and 1 Thessalonians 2, Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, 
but Satan hindered us. So it's very clear that Satan is not currently bound in the abyss. In <clears throat> well, for one, the abyss is your, uh, the, your words, not the words of God, okay? In verse 4, it goes on to say that John saw the souls of those who were beheaded. They had made it through the great tribulation and not taken the mark and would reign with Christ for 1,000 years. Amillennials believe that we are currently reigning with Christ, but this isn't true. When the Oh, you're not reigning with Christ right now? Then you're not saved right now by your own words. If you're judged on your words, and then out of your mouth comes words that condemn yourself. You think about that. Jesus comes not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. It is you, or this fella, or the unbelievers, that condemn themselves by their own words now they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection who is the first resurrection well Jesus says very plainly I, Jesus, am the resurrection. You know, what in the world is going on here? What, what in the world just happened? Did I misspell that? I am res. Oh, duh. I am dumb. Okay, right there it is. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection. You can't figure that out. You can't figure out this is Jesus is the first resurrection. Even though he plainly says, I am the resurrection. You thought you were going to be the first resurrection? Come on, man. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection has part we are partakers of his resurrection <clears throat> right now the second death has no power over us now think about that Jesus says I am the resurrection and the life he that believeth in me though he were dead yet shall he live and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die the second death has no power over us that are born of God right now we are priests of God and of Christ and we reign with him it's a very unique time period I showed you already in Exodus 19 that the children of Israel that which is are the children of God they are a kingdom of priests. I showed you in uh, First Peter. Oh, golly, I can't remember what verse was that. First Peter two, that we are a royal priesthood. Right? We, that's not enough for you. You don't. You don't see that. That we are priests of God right now? Well, did you not read the very first chapter of Revelation 1? Where it says, He has made us kings and priests unto God? And you have to willfully ignore a huge part of the scripture to make this argument against or the argument for 
premillennialism or whatever, you know, this argument that, hey, I'm not reigning with Christ. By your own words, man, you're not saved. That's the problem. And you want to say all oh, this shouldn't cause division? <laughs> you divided yourself, man. Unbelievable. The rapture and you notice here, they came to life again. Is that what it says? No, it says they lived and reigned with Christ. They came to life? Well, the only way they can justify that phrasing is if they say they were passed from death to life. Just as the scripture says, passed from death to life when we are born of the Spirit of God. All right, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me, has everlasting life and shall not come in, into condemnation but is passed from death to life this parallels what i just shared with you in john chapter 11 that whosoever believeth liveth and believeth in me shall never die we that are born of god have passed from death to life first john chapter 3 verse 14 we know that we have passed from death unto life All right, we have passed from death to life so that's the only way they can justify it now in the to uh, put it in the scripture written that way it is not justified to say that they came to life is a reference to the end of the world when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and they are resurrected into their glorified bodies it's very deceptive. It's very wicked. It's evil. Happens and the dead in Christ rise first, as in 1 Thessalonians 5, what happens to our bodies? 1 Corinthians 15 tells us, in the twinkling of an eye, oh, our bodies... See, this is interesting here. Didn't I show you that earlier? 1 Corinthians 15. Let's see. It's not telling the whole story, right? Not telling the whole story. Where do they go to? Check this out. They go to 53, don't they? Why is that? Well, that's because the very next verse says, Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. So, that's going to destroy their argument that there's going to be death after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and that this idea of a thousand years after the end of the world that there's gonna continue to be death right I mean that, that's why you don't share that verse you hide that one pretend like it's not there all right it's unbelievable what these people are teaching yeah, I don't I don't see how you can be saved when you say yourself you're not reigning with Christ right now. Our bodies are changed to immortal bodies. So if we are in the millennium now, as amillennialists believe, then we should be ruling with Christ in glorified bodies. And that certain... <laughs> that doesn't even begin to make sense. Because 1 Corinthians 15 is clearly when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven at the last trump. There's no, it's, it's not rational to make that statement. Certainly isn't happening. Not to mention that in the New Jerusalem, Isaiah 65 right, tells... Here we go. Let's get real stupid here. All right. So, you'll notice he, um, so I got a little bit of an issue with, where, where am I at here? A little bit of an issue with the wording of the NASP. I mean, obviously, even Frank, Dr. Frank Logston condemned his own Bible. And he's said he was in trouble. Well, I'm afraid I'm in trouble with the Lord. This is wrong. This is terribly wrong. The NASB is terribly wrong. 
by his own words. The guy that put together the NASB. It's unbelievable. Okay, so the problem is, they're uh, here in the NASB. It said, no longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days. All right, well, that's not what it says, man. What it says is, there shall be no more thence an infant of days. Yeah, it's kind of different. Now, nor an old man that has not filled his days. For the child shall die in a hundred years old, but the sinner being in a hundred years old shall be accursed. And I'll tell you again, I've gone over this a few times, but again, the child, we are a child of God. Right? There's a, we, either you're a child of God or you're a sinner. All right? So, if you're a child of God, you might be a hundred years old, but still a child, because you're a child of God. You could be, on the other hand, you could be a sinner and be a hundred years old and be accursed, right? Cursed, because you do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Pretty simple stuff. And not only that, we get more clarity out of the New Testament than we do the Old Testament. If you struggle at all, well, learn the New Testament and then understand it and then go back and learn the Old Testament. And then this stuff will start to make sense. All right, so what you're, what you're saying, what he's saying here is that this is in regards to the thousand years after the Lord Jesus Christ comes. But in nowhere does it suggest a thousand year period at all in Isaiah 60, anywhere in the Bible, not even Revelation 20, but especially not Isaiah 65. Tells us that people that don't live until a hundred will be considered accursed. So the saints will be reigning with Christ in glorified bodies, and the people that populate the millennial kingdom will be living very long lives. So this just further... Okay, so that's just another way of saying there's going to be sex in this world after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. And this is... Again, here, I better do this. Exactly what we were told would happen in the last days. People walking after their own lust. Knowing this first, that there shall come a time, or shall come in the last days, scoffers, walking after their own lust. And so, this is what they're teaching. Very subtle, but that's what they're saying, that people will continue to populate the earth meaning having sex. All right, here in John, uh, 1 John chapter 2, uh, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abides forever so when Jesus comes it's the end of the world and there will be no more hanky panky it's going to be much greater than that all right so this guy's vision and I've showed you this before this guy's vision is that Jesus comes he's transformed into his glorified body and he's able to have sex like he did when he was 20 years old that's what they teach and I've showed that before not everybody's going to admit it, understandably so, because it makes them look like perverts, but that's what they believe. Further proves that we are not in the millennium now. Another amillennial belief is that there is just one general resurrection of both believers and non-believers. But Revelation... <laughs> why, why would they... Why would anybody say that, huh? Well... You want to you wanna explain this one? And many of them, Daniel chapter 12, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame 
and everlasting contempt. Now we could go Matthew 25, uh, Matthew uh, 13, the parable of the wheat and the tares. There's only one a resurrection. It's all throughout the Bible, right? And before him shall be gathered all nations. He shall separate them one from another as a sheep divides his as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Revelation 26 speaks of the first resurrection, and it's a blessed thing to be in that one. And then in verses 7 to 20, it makes it quite clear that after a thousand years, Satan is released and eventually thrown into the lake of fire. Yeah, it's quite clear that when Satan is released, he goes out to deceive the nations to gather them together. I don't know how you miss it. You got to be willfully stupid and blind. I mean, you have to be blind to not see it. We are up in the air when this happens. And so everybody on earth, it's just like it was in the Old Testament outside of the nation of Israel, outside of the children of Israel. Inside the children of Israel were was the kingdom of God. Now the kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes in him. It's all around the world. And so when Jesus comes, we are all lifted up out of this world. And so now all you got on the world are unsaved people. So once again, Satan is allowed to deceive them. And when in the purpose of this releasing, being loosed, is to gather them together. Just like what we read in Matthew 25, Mike, uh, um, all throughout the Bible. It's unbelievable. How, how do you miss that? It's unbelievable. All right, and so what happens? They compass the camp of the saints about. We're up in the air. The camp of the saint, up, the camp of the saints is up in the air. The beloved city. The beloved city is up in the air, right? The, the beloved city is new, Jerusalem, all right? Jerusalem, which is above, is free and the mother of us all. That's the beloved city. How do you not know this? And you're a doctor. You're an expert. You're a scholar. You're smart. And a master of, of the scripture. And you don't know this? Unbelievable. If fire comes down from God out of heaven, devours them. You can't have the camp of the saints on the earth when God sends fire down out of heaven. We are clearly up in the air, and this is prophesied all throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. When God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, thou shalt bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is when Jesus stomps his foot on the head of the serpent, destroying evil forever. All right. Yeah, I mean, this is prophesied all throughout the Bible. All right. Let me go to Psalm 110, for example. All right, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool, right? Revelation 3, verse 9, Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. We're going to be up in the air, and they are going to be at our feet. Then the second resurrection occurs and the great white throne judgment happens. So these are definitely two separate resurrections spanned by over a thousand years. That's so ridiculous, not supported anywhere in the scripture at all. And there's just an overwhelming amount of scripture that supports one resurrection at the end of the world. One judgment at the end of the world. One end of the world. The final thing I want to bring up is a point I found on the Lake Chuck Missler site. He explains how the amillennial view also puts God's character into question. In Luke 1, Gabriel tells Mary that she'll give birth to a son and will call him Jesus. That God will give him the throne of his father David. So this isn't a throne in heaven, 
this is a political throne on earth that did not exist in Jesus. Yeah, so the vote for Obama, and uh, there you go. That's Jesus. Lifetime. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Has that happened? Have no. <laughs> it's unbelievable. They quote it, they say it, they see it, and they say it, but they don't understand it. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. They'll see it. They'll say it. And then turn around and say, well, it's only a thousand years. Yeah. Dumb. That is dumb, isn't it? No. When Jesus was here, they crucified him. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible how blind these guys are. Of course, it exactly fits with you know what the Bible says but here it is Luke chapter 1 he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end yet they believe there's going to be a thousand year kingdom on earth it's not supported by the Bible anywhere at all Jesus does not reign a thousand years Jesus reigns for ever.